There's the mic unmuting itself. That was a very groovy intro. We had a lot of real dancers in the background there. That was a lot of fun. Uh, my name is Jesse. I'm your virtual adventure guide here with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And I know we've got a broad new audience today. And so if you are joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world to over 40 live, free, monthly interactive broadcasts. I really want to thank all our teachers for joining us on this incredible international adventure we've been on over the last few weeks. We've had the chance to go to, I think, 20 countries in like 30 days, which is insane. It's the most uh, wide-ranging schedule we've ever had, but particularly for joining us today, because today marks the second of our amazing series in conjunction with Impact 5. Impact 5 is the International Marine Protected Areas Congress happening in Vancouver, BC right now. And it is nothing less than the world coming together to talk about and plan towards a future for the oceans on this planet. We are trying to protect over 30% of the ocean ecosystems in the world by 2030. We're trying to bring indigenous rights into the fray and make sure that people of all kinds all around the globe have a voice in this conversation. And it's a really, really special series of events and activities happening. And you can check it all out at impact5.ca. Now, for Impact 5, I got approached a few months ago by the amazing Diz Lothero. She is with the Canadian Ocean Literacy Coalition, and together with them and the All-Atlantic Blue Schools Network, we are partnering on a four-part epic extravaganza featuring some of the best young voices on this planet for ocean advocacy and work. Yesterday, we were joined by Bodhi Patil. He did an amazing program. You can check that one out on our YouTube channel, and I highly encourage you to do so. But today, I'm going to turn it over to Diz first before I introduce our speaker, but we've got a special follow-up to this. So... Um, backtracking tab. I'm going to turn it over to Diz from the Ocean Literacy Coalition to explain a little bit about what Impact 5 is all about before I introduce our speaker and we get underway. Diz, welcome to the broadcast again. Long time no see. <laughs> Great to see you again, Jesse, and good morning, good afternoon to all the students gathered with us today. We are delighted to have you. Thanks for making the time and being here with us. Impact 5 is a really special occasion. We have global leaders who are working in the conservation field from around the world, scientists, educators, policymakers, decision makers, indigenous leaders, and one of the big groups here that are really making um, a big contribution in, in the discussions, in the actions moving forward is the early career young professionals. And that's what this series is all about, is we're bringing you four of the many dynamic young people here who are really driving the leadership of the discussions here. And today, it's just amazing to have Ayambo with us. We all know that a healthy ocean is essential to a healthy future for all of us. And there's one interconnected global ocean. So it requires one big global effort. And it's incredible to have young students part of these discussions. The whole reason why we want to have the series this week is not only to introduce you to people like Ayamba and Bodhi yesterday and two more to come, but also for you as leaders, not just future leaders, but today you guys are doing great work in your communities and we need you. You're all part of the global team. So thanks so much for joining us. And I'm gonna turn it over to the real leader here. Thank thanks, you Jess. so much, Diz. I am like constantly inspired by you. I have such a good time. Professional detachments just out the window. You do such an amazing job at Impact 5 and, and everywhere. But as you said, we're going to turn it over to the star of the show today. I am is joining us, and he is the founder and director of the Environment and Food Foundation in Cameroon. Does incredible work on all the biggest issues that our classes are always so fascinated with, wanting to take action. And today, I am is going to walk through some of the work that he's done to do just that and hopefully inspire your classes to do the same. So welcome to the broadcast, man. Thanks for joining us at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, and take us away. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Jess, for that warm introduction. Also, thank you, Dis, for inviting me here to share my initiative, my work, in my local community back in Cameroon. And thank you for making me part of the Ocean Conservation for School series, live here from IMPA 5, Vancouver, Canada. So my name is Achare Elvis Ayamba. By profession, I am an engineer in fisheries and aquatic ecosystem management. So I hold a postgraduate in fisheries and aquatic ecosystem management. And I'm the founder and the executive director of Environment and Food Foundation. So let me just start by saying what happened before I founded the Environment and Food Foundation or what pushed me to start this initiative. Back long when I was still a child in the village, I've been a lover of our waters. I always go to the water to do swimming. I always go to do fishing in my in waters in my community. And after some time, 
you can imagine this water was just, it just disappeared. No more, the water just, the stream disappeared. And I didn't know what happened. I was like, what was the real issue behind the disappearance of this stream? And all through my secondary school, I've ever loved biology as my best subject. Immediately I finished my secondary school, I went to the university to study fisheries and aquatic sciences. And immediately I started this career pathway. I saw the trades on our marine and freshwater ecosystem. And I saw the important needs, the resources, the services that are being provided by our marine and freshwater ecosystem, yet they are highly being threatened by human-induced activities. Also seeing this alarming rate of marine plastic pollution on our environment, on our marine and freshwater ecosystem, both on land and on sea, was something that also pushed me into this. Also, I know the importance of our mangroves, the rich biodiversity they have, and what value they provide to everybody, both the plants, both the ecosystem, and humans. Also, mindful of the threats on our wetlands, this all pushed me to start the Environment and Food Foundation. And what is Environment and Food Foundation all about? Environment and Food Foundation is a community-based organization in Cameroon that is working with indigenous and local communities to hold and reverse the degradation of marine and freshwater ecosystem and build a future in which all humans have the right mindset to live in harmony with our natural environment, with nature, with our ocean. And we mostly engage in campaigns, advocacy, and policy activities. We engage in environmental education in local and indigenous communities, in schools. Also, we engage to target this trade of marine litter in our coastline along the coast of Cameroon. This involves plastic bottles. This involves abandoned loss and discarded ghost gears. We also do some research to see the root causes of this problem and to bring out some scientific recommendation. So we try to do research, both indigenous research and scientific research. And most importantly, we engage in conservation activities. Our vision, to just to cut it short, is to build a future in which humans have the right mindset to live with our natural environment. Talking about the lakes, the streams, the rivers, the mangroves, the wetlands, the forests, every natural environment that surrounds us yeah, our goal is to empower climate action and conserve and protect biodiversity and nature and to reduce pollution, environmental pollution, especially marine pollution. Now, let me take you a bit deeper into some of the programs we run at the Environment and Food Foundation. Uh, one of our programs is a participatory conservation and restoration of mangrove forest ecosystem in the coast of Cameroon, in the Cameroon estuary. This is, Cameroon has a very long, big, broad coastline and it is highly threatened. We have a lot of mangrove biodiversity, but it is also highly threatened. For those of us that are familiar with mangroves, this happened to be one of the richest ecosystems in the universe. They play a very crucial role in terms of food production, in terms of nursery for marine and freshwater organisms. And some of the activities we do here is environmental education, and awareness raising in local communities and in schools. We go to these indigenous coastal communities, we educate them on the importance of mangroves. We go to these indigenous local schools, we educate them on the importance of mangroves and how they could also become part of the initiative to conserve our mangroves. We engage in setting up in community trees, community nurseries in these communities. And when we set up these nurseries, they are being managed, they are being controlled by the indigenous communities. And also we engage these indigenous community members in the replanting of these trees. We plant mangrove trees in some of these degraded mangrove forest ecosystem. We also have cleanup events that we do in this mangrove. This is to tell you that our mangroves have been flooded with plastic pollution, with plastic waste, with marine plastic debris. Like you can see on the other image at the right edge, you see a lot of plastic pollution in our mangroves. And that is something we do on a regular basis, engaging local communities in cleanups in these mangrove ecosystems. Also, another program that we have is a biodiversity conservation and restoration through community, community participation in the Lake Osa Wildlife Reserve. This is, another, this is a wetland of international importance with great biodiversity 
of terrestrial and aquatic organisms. Some of the activities that we engage here, again, environmental education is a key. We know education is a key and we do education with these indigenous community members. We do education, environmental education with these indigenous and local community schools that are around the Lake Osa Wildlife Reserve. And we try to improve their knowledge on biodiversity conservation, on the importance of this lake. We also try to improve the livelihood of these indigenous community members by training them on other alternative livelihoods, like we have bee farming, we have piggery, we have poultry, we have senior farming. We try to improve their livelihood in order to improve their standard of living. One of the main threats today on the Lake Osa is the invasion of invasive aquatic weeds, Sarvinia molesta. This weed has surrounded the entire lake and is a big threat. This is a main threat today on the Lake Osa. What we are trying to do now is to engage the community, the indigenous community, in the manual collection of Sarvinia molesta from the Lake Osa. You can see the second photo on the slide. That is, we, we are working with indigenous community. We mobilize them to engage, to collect this Savinia from the lake. And we are looking forward to engage also in mechanical cleaning of this lake, where we want to bring a sea vessel, a sea cleaning vessel, in order to remove Savinia molester from the Lake Osa. Lake Osa happened to be the biggest lake in Cameroon of over 4,000 4,000 hectares, but today about 60% of this lake has been invaded, have been covered by invasive aquatic weed, Savinia molesta, which is a big problem to this lake. And this lake is a refuge to vulnerable uh, African manatee, which is a, 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 an aquatic species, rich, I mean, of high international value of conservation. This species is highly threatened today by this Savinia in the Lake Osa. And we also engage in promoting and developing agroforestry in the Lake Osa Wildlife Reserve. We set up community plan nurseries, indigenous plan, as you can see in the other the picture, that, that is a community nursery that has been set up, managed by the community, and we engage them in planting these indigenous plants in this Lake Osa, along the banks of Lake Osa, in order to reduce erosion and landslide. And we also do some ecotourism activities around the Lake Osa wildlife reserve. And another program is the, progr the program to mitigate the problem of ghost gear in our communities along the coast of Cameroon. We collect and we manage abandoned loss or otherwise discarded fishing gears along the coastline of Cameroon. There we have a big problem because our community, most of these community members living along the coast, their principal activity is fishing. And when they fish, when the net is bad, they dump it in the water or they dump it along the banks of the water, along the shoreline. And it's a big threat to our marine ecosystem. We are trying now to raise awareness with these community members on how they could manage these nets, abandoned nets, lost goose gears, that when it is bad, we can valorize them into other products. We also engage in the collection of these abandoned loss or otherwise discarded fishing gears and we use these fishing gears to produce crafts. That is another activity. Crafts using ghost gears. We use it to produce eco mats. We use it to produce eco shoes and among many others. Now, this is like the fourth program that we are running and it's like one of our main program at the Environment and Food Foundation. This program, it's all about collecting and valorizing plastic waste bottles. And it is something that is one of the main threats on our marine and freshwater ecosystem in Cameroon. A lot of plastic bottles flooding the entire ocean, the entire communities. We engage in cleanups with local community members on a regular basis. We engage also in valorizing this plastic into crafts. And yeah, this, this, this problem is a problem. I know it's a global problem, but in particularly in my community, it is more, more, more alarming. And you see us there doing some cleanup, see us there trying to transport, and you see us there doing some valorization of these collected plastics that we have collected. Yeah, this is just like a summary of some of the things we have done so far and some of the achievements. And 
what we have achieved so far. Yeah, so I would just like to conclude. Though I, I have a video here I wanted to play, if time would permit us. I don't know if we still have some time. I don't know, but... I oh, yeah. Lots of time to play the video. Tons of time, man. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, so just like, let me first conclude, then I'll play this video. I'm just saying that we are in the decade of action and everybody, everybody must get involved in this. We must protect at least 30% of our ocean by 2030. We are already in 2023 and time is running out and limited action is being put in place. It is time to act. It is time for action. And everybody must be involved, especially us, the youths. We have the power, we have the energy, we have the strength. We must take the lead. We must take the lead. We must do our best. Everybody from children to youth, all stakeholders, they must get involved. Global youth, we are all dynamic and we must work together for sustainable action. We must be the key stakeholders in order to mitigate all these threats we see on our natural environment, especially on our ocean. We carry, in fact, we have the, the strength, like we say, we are the backbone. We have the, we must use this privilege, this strength that we have now to work and do the action now. Youth, we are rational thinkers, we are innovative, let's be creative, let's be thinking on innovative solutions. All the, maybe some solutions have failed, we now need to look into how we can be more innovative in our solution. We must be more creative in our solutions. So maybe I will go back to try to play this. Oh, so we don't see it on our end, Ayamba. Uh, I know it's playing, but it's playing on a different screen. Let me see if I can get it up for us. Here we go. We got to come. Give me two quick seconds. See if we can get this up for everybody, folks. I think he's... Yeah, I'm just saying we, we don't see it on this screen. We still see your slide deck as opposed to the YouTube video. And I okay. want to make sure we can see it for everyone. Yeah. Can you drop that link to Jesse? Take your time, guys. Oh, good. We got tons of time. Here, I'll let you play around with that. While we're doing that, I will note we're going to go to question and answer soon. So for any of our friends on YouTube, if you guys want to share questions in the chat, please do on either the Ocean Literacy Coalition site uh, or our Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants YouTube and our live classes in Oregon, Ms. Agravat's class, Ms. Ty Holland's class. Get ready. I'm coming into you guys very, very shortly once we get this video up. And uh, here we go. I got it in my chat here. I'm going to cue this up for everyone and we will play it for everybody. Thanks, guys, for sending that along. And let me just two quick seconds here and we will be good to go. All right, perfect. A little three minute video. Get a chance to see some of this amazing stuff that I am is up to firsthand. Thank you for making that work, everybody. All right, should be good to go. In 2021, Plastic Oceans International launched the Global Blue Communities Initiative, a collective of organizations working together to build sustainable communities as a means to end plastic pollution. My name is Achare Elvis Ayamba. I am a Cameroonian by nationality. I'm the founder and the director of the Environment and Food Foundation. Environment and Food Foundation is an official partner of the Blue Communities Initiative of Plastic Oceans International. Plastic pollution is a major threat here in Douala, Cameroon, most particularly plastic bottles. There is little or no recycling system here in Douala right now. Most of the plastic that leaves the city of Douala is carried by runoff into the mangroves and the Bois de Singe Wildlife Reserve. I saw the threat on this very important system. Now, I was very interested to see how we can put our hands together to be part of the solution to the threat.
we are engaged in many activities. We do cleanups, we work on the conservation of mango forest ecosystem, we work on the collection and valorization of plastic waste, we do environmental education in communities. The number of volunteers keep on increasing every day. It gives us hope, it gives us courage. There are many other people, other organizations and NGOs that are joining us to do this work. The awareness is gaining ground. And we need to continue raising young environmental warriors who can also take the lead. They are the future leaders of tomorrow. The rivers we see are all drainage. They drain themselves in oceans. These bottles are collected to clean the rivers and also to clean our oceans. Now we really want to see how we can set up a recycling factory to collect this plastic waste and recycle them into other products. That is just our dream here in Douala for now. Plastic pollution is a problem that cannot be solved in isolation, but instead must be done collaboratively to uncover the interconnections and complexities between planet, people, and economy. Together, blue communities from around the globe can achieve a vision for a healthier and more just planet for all. Be part of it. Look at that. What a great video. I am, but you're such an inspiring guy. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. And I'm so excited to dive in with our classes for questions over the next few minutes. Um, again, YouTube classes, please feel free to share questions there. We'd love to hear from you as well. I have a question to kick off before we head to our first class in, in Bend in Oregon. When you're planting the forest, are you planting seeds or are you planting tiny saplings, tiny trees? Yeah, we, we, raise, we raise the seeds in uh, nurseries and we plant the seedlings. The seedlings yeah. So yeah. like so on the slide, we set up community nurseries that have been managed and controlled by the communities and we engage them in the planting of these trees. Fantastic. I, we've we've uh, had the chance to feature a lot of tree planting programs around the world, and it's so beautiful to see a nursery set up with lots of the little trees to go out and start planting them. It's one of the most uh, impactful things that people can do, and, and I know a lot of our classes have done actions like that uh, close to home as well, which is fantastic. I'm going to head to Miss Ty Holland's class. They're joining us right now in Toronto, uh, and uh, if you guys want to come in grade fives and kick us off with a question, you're good to go. Hey. Hi. Hi. Can you hear us? Yeah, you're perfect. Marira, come here. Marira has the first question. Hi. Perfect. Hi. Hi. What is mangroves? What are yeah? What are mangroves? I am. I love this question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, mangroves are plants that grow. Yeah, they're always like between the land and the ocean, and they serve like uh, like filters. Uh, you always see mangroves, they have like roots like this. I don't know how to say this in English. Yeah, and this this is a very rich ecosystem that is between the land and the ocean, between the land and the sea. And yeah. they play a very crucial role because firstly, it serves like energy ground for most of these marine organisms. They come to the mangrove because in the mangroves, we don't have water current. The water is calm. They come to the mangroves to do nursery. They come to the mangroves to to lay. Let me say to lay their eggs and to hatch their eggs. All fish, even fishes, come to the mangrove for this. And mangroves also serve like a, a refuge ground for most of these uh, marine and freshwater organisms that are living in our ocean. Yeah. Herbert, I, I, uh, when I was a kid, when I was in grade five, about the age of these students, I'd never heard of mangroves myself. And so here's a chance just to see some pictures of some mangrove roots. They're really, really special trees and plants. They're special organisms and they're 
special ecosystems. They're a really unique kind of ecosystem on this planet where the, as Ayamba said, the forest meets the sea sort of, uh, and just a, a really uh, important place. We're starting to have more and more conversations around the globe at programs like Impact 5 to highlight the importance of mangroves because they're so rare and they're under a lot of threat. So I'm really glad we got that question. Uh, our Bend, Oregon class, OFS classroom, if you guys have a question for us and you wanted to come up, uh, I'll come to you in just a second. Yep, you're good to go. Hi there. Welcome in, Miss Cowhug. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, you're perfect. Okay, I have Avi here. She's going to ask her question. Hi, Avi. Hi. Um, what kind of crafts do you make out of the plastic bottles? Yeah. So, Ayamba, if you had caught that, what kind of crafts do you make out of the plastic oh. bottles? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, thank you very much for that interesting question. We use plastic bottles to make, uh, we firstly, we call them eco ties or eco bricks. These are, these are like bricks that we use, like, let me say, like pavement. They use them like for wood construction and even in houses, like you put them on the, uh, the surface of your, 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 your surrounding environment, even on roads. So we use this eco plastic bottles to make eco bricks or eco ties. And also we use plastic bottles to produce uh, eco benches, you no know, subset of uh, traditional or indigenous benches that are being crafted using like the traditional, traditional ropes. And we use plastic bottles to attach them together. It sort of form a sort of eco bench or eco chair that we use in our indigenous communities. We also use, we also use plastics to, to make sort of a bob covering in that is we can use this like to decorate our houses and even like in indigenous community you can use this to decorate your bob for instance if your plastic bottle is blue we use you can attach a plastic bottle and you put it on your bob it makes the bob to become like blue light yeah <laughs> very, very cool. and we also like for the for the, the abandoned discarded ghost gears of the uh, yeah Fishing yeah. gears, we use plastics to produce uh, what we call eco mats yeah. of crafts work. All of this is craft work, and also we use it to produce uh, eco shoes that we, yeah, so all of this is a form of craft work. So this is something that I, I've been, it's been fascinating for me to see this start coming to Canada and the United States, because for years, other countries around the world have been using plastics for materials and for things like this that are beautiful, that are functional, that are amazing. And it's only in the last 10 years or so that you started to see companies in North America where they're like, oh, you know, we can take these plastics and make sunglasses or skateboards or any number of things. But upcycling the waste in that way is so impactful and it makes such a positive statement for uh, sort of the, the, you know, it changes how people think about trash and things to throw away. Um, I'm going to head to Miss Agravat's class in just a second in New York uh, if we want to, but before I do, it was interesting watching the people pick up the things for the recycling bags. So I noticed that they reached past certain bottles to grab certain bottles. Are there only certain kinds of plastic that can be used for these materials or how does it work? <laughs> yes, of course, uh, like the plastics, not all can be useful to do everything. Like yeah. in terms of when we want to do shredding, we need to sort the plastics. There are plastics that we cannot shred. The ones that are highly polluted or very, very destroyed or too, too bad. We mostly use clean plastic bottles for shredding. But yep. in terms of the one for eco bricks, every type of plastic can go, especially those that have become very dirty and very polluted yep. because we can easily recycle into eco bricks. Yeah. Very cool. I, I actually, you mentioned something there that I want to note for our classes. If you today drink from a plastic bottle or a pop bottle or whatever, you should wash it before you put it in the recycling bin. Rinse it out with water if you have that opportunity, because then it can be used for more things. It can be recycled more easily. Uh, make sure you don't just throw something with a bunch of food waste on it. It really does make a big difference uh, down the line if it has to be recycled. Uh, New Rochelle, New York. If you guys want to unmute your mic in Miss Agravat's class, I'm going to come to you now. Uh, come on in for a question. Hi. Hi, this is Iggy. This is my fifth grade class. And hey, Iggy, <laughs> um, have you ever used machines for your plastic cleanup? Yeah, any machines, any robots for the cleanup? <laughs> no, 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 no. We don't have this type of technology, but 
<laughs> Hopefully, we might have it in the future. We use our hand. Yeah, we use yeah. our hand to pick, picking uh, up. The, yeah, we don't yet have clean up machines. We hope I we have when I did my first cleanup, they gave us, um, it was like a long stick with a little grabby at the end. And I did that for a bit. And then I said, you know, it's so much faster to just use yeah. my hands and throw yeah. it in the yeah. <laughs> you know, It's great if you have the opportunity to have machines or robots if they're more efficient. But there's nothing like a bunch of volunteers as we had the yeah. chance to see. Uh, the, 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 the facts, the statistics of all the things that you've cleaned, the amount of waste you've taken out is just unbelievable. And so there you go. Students, if you get the chance to head out and clean up a place near you, even if it's a park, uh, that really does go a long way to helping the ocean and helping uh, wildlife in the area too. Great question, guys. All right. I'm going to go back to Miss Ty Holland's class. Um, I, Ayama, you're so fast. You've got so many Time for so much questions is great. Um, Miss Ty Holland, Toronto, come back in, grade fives. Hi, guys. <laughs> Why so much garbage? Yeah, so I, 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 love, I love that one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you for that one. And this question is really amazing. Yeah, there's much garbage, and that you saw that on the video, in the pictures, but that is not even the places that are more polluted than that. Yeah. Because, let me start firstly, because we have very bad policy system. Let me say our leaders, our government, decision makers, they don't take things serious. They, there's a policy that states that when these companies, water bottling companies and brewery companies that use plastic for packaging, when they produce, they must recycle or they must see how they can support recycling. But yeah. it's on the papers, but they are not being implemented. So firstly, I will blame our leaders, our government, because of lack of action. They don't take serious action in order to follow up these companies and give them even sanctions for doing, doing this because they don't, they, don't, they don't support recycling. They produce, and once, for instance, you buy a bottle of water, a bottle of juice that's packaged in plastic, once you consume it once, you throw it on the community. So nobody controls like how can we send this back into the recycling system and secondly there's a problem of very bad mentality yeah we have poor mentality if you saw environment and food foundation our motto is renewing environmental mindfulness the mind of people is very bad they don't have they are not environmentally conscious for instance consuming plastic and you also thinking of how we can recycle this. Everybody lit is littered everywhere. I just need to buy my bottle of plastic water. I mean, I buy a bottle of water packaged in plastic, and once I consume, I just need to throw it anywhere. Yeah, there's nothing like there's a point you can, or you gather this and keep it somewhere or do this, do this. That's why we are now trying to raise this awareness in our local communities. We are now trying to educate people, telling them this plastic you see, Maybe you consider it as waste. It's not waste. It's having a value. Plastic is a resource. We now tell them that plastic is not waste. Plastic is a resource. So when you consume your bottle of water in plastic packaging, keep it somewhere, gather it somewhere. And this is what we are doing now in our communities. We try to incentivize the collection of these plastic bottles and we sell them to recycling or plastic companies that do shredding or recycle. We tell them, keep your bottles, or you can move around your community. You pick some bottles around your community. You pack, you keep them somewhere. We are going to come and collect this. We pass around, we collect this with our tricycles or other vehicles. This is what we are trying to do. And it's something that just started. And we need to continue to raise this awareness to educate more people, to create. But like you heard from the video, the awareness is gaining ground. People are becoming more conscious. People are becoming, they are really seeing the reason why we should try to reduce this plastic in our communities. Yeah, bad mindset. People are not educated. People are, yeah, like this program is about ocean literacy. It's something that is really still lacking in our community. And um, we need to amplify the voices of like educate more people to become like ocean literates. Many people are ignorant. They don't understand this. They don't know what this plastic costs us, the impact, how it contributes to climate change. We have been experiencing a lot of floods in my community in Douala, Cameroon, because of these plastic bottles. They clot in our, in our waterways, they clot in our gutters, and when heavy rain pours, 
the rain now can't flow into these gutters, they flow on the road, they flow into people's houses, and it has been flood, flood, flood every time. And when this is happening, people are now becoming more conscious. Wow, we now need to see how we can clean our communities. We now need to see how we can eradicate this. And when we engage, we educate them, we call them, we mobilize them to come and join us for cleanups. This is what we do on a regular basis. Yeah, thank you very much. And it's becoming something like a source of livelihood to our many community members. We're already having a team of over 100 volunteers and we incentivize the collection of this plastic. You pick, you sell, you have some money to, to feed yourself, to sustain yourself. Yeah, it's becoming a source of employment to many youths in our community. It's becoming a source of livelihood and people are becoming, are getting <laughs> engaged in this and they enjoy, the, they enjoy doing it. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. It, it's such a great turnaround of the mentality. And it's something where Canadian kids, I grew up in a different culture where people were, you know, and people still are ignorant. I, I go to a grocery store and people buy pallets of 500 bottles of water when you can get clean water out of a tap every single day. And so it does require that mindset shift. There's nothing wrong with being ignorant, but you have to be open to learning and open to understanding these ideas to change your habits, to make a positive difference. And one of the things that I thought was so great about the video is that it is, for a Canadian, it's shocking to see a river covered in plastic. Where it's yeah. everywhere. Because we don't see that that often, but we yeah. don't see that because we take our garbage and we ship it elsewhere. So for us, you know, oh, I've got this bottle, I throw it in the trash. Well, that ends up somewhere. Sometimes it ends up in a place where it's recycled. Sometimes it ends up in a place where it's treated well and, and maybe put in a landfill that's well managed. And sometimes it ends up in someone else's river around the world or in the ocean. And so we have this mindset where we need to recognize that trash, no matter where it's produced, if you make waste, it ends up somewhere. It doesn't just disappear by magic. And it's really important to have that. So thank you for that, that insightful answer, Ayama. I, I appreciate that. Um, Ms. Kavahog's class, I'm going to head back to you guys in Oregon. Ms. Agravat, we're going to wrap up with you. We've got time for two more questions, but come on in, in Bend, if you guys have another one. You're back in the broadcast. Hey. I do have one question. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Perfectly. Okay. My question is, um, how is the government receiving the work that you do? Are they recognizing it? Are they, is it moving them at all? Or are they still... Uh, nothing has changed. Yeah, as we continue to raise awareness, we continue to advocate, we continue to do these campaigns. The government is also, they are getting more concerned because they now start to hear our voices. We have what we call stakeholder workshops that we organize and we invite some of these government officials where we share ideas, we tell them on how we need to put hands together to solve this problem. And they always, they always come and they listen to us and they accept our recommendations. But at the level of implementation, it's still a problem and normally it would take some time. But we believe things are changing gradually, but not as, as speedy as we want, but they are changing gradually. We just have to see how we can speed up the process for maybe a rapid change. But gradually things are changing. The government is becoming responsive. They are becoming like taking some responsibilities. They encourage us, they give us the permit, they give us authority, they give us the go ahead that we should continue what we are doing. It's really good because they themselves, they need stakeholders like us that can stand to, to address us problem. And they encourage us to continue that they are, they are right behind us to support us in how they can do. Yeah, so I think uh, the government is trying to see into it that their actions, like I said, they are very slow. They can, <laughs> we are running out of time. We just need to see how we can maybe put more pressure on them, mount more pressure on them for maybe a rapid change. Yeah. But I, I love this answer. And this is something, when I was a kid, if you told me that I could do stuff and I could go learn things and that the government would listen to me, I would have said that you were crazy. So the fact that you've done this and amassed these volunteers, gotten this community behind you, have proven that these are, are valuable concepts and ways of changing your mind that benefit everyone in the community and that people take you seriously, listen to you, that you are, are so lauded that you have the opportunity to come and talk about this to the world at Impact 5 is a yeah. testament to you personally, but it's a testament to the power of ideas from young people as well. And so I'm really glad you, you shared all that with us today. And I, I hope our students take note and go take action in their own community. You can really make a big difference 
wherever you happen to be joining from. Speaking of, of far away and, and wherever you happen to be joining from, we're going to wrap up with this Agrabats class coming back to New Holland. Uh, if you guys want to unmute your mic, you are good to go. Uh, welcome back. Hi, guys. Uh, this Hi. is Lucy. Hi. How much has your program helped your village? Yeah, how much has it helped the village or the town, community? How much has the... Yeah, how, how much is your work, like, oh, again... Yeah. Helped yeah. your community, helped your, your city. Uh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Of course, of course. It has helped. Like, let me start at the level of improving the livelihood of the community members. It has helped them because we empower them. We build their capacity on alternative sources of livelihood. For instance, the project of the Lake Osa Wildlife Reserve. This is like a lake, a biggest lake in Cameroon, and the community depend on this lake as a, for fishing activities, and this is their main source of income, their main livelihood. But today, this lake has been flooded by invasive aquatic weed. They don't have the they don't have the means to do fishing anymore. They cannot do fishing in this lake. The lake is gradually dying, meaning there's little or no uh, fishes in this lake. Now, what they do is they are crying of poverty. They lack this. They lack that. We try to empower them on an alternative livelihood. I mentioned about bee farming. You know, bee farming is a very eco-friendly activity. You know how important the pollinate the bee helped to to in terms of pollination, and this is something that they love doing. And this is very rich. It's very rich. They sell this and make a lot of money out of it. We we train them. We empower them on bee farming. We provide the materials to them. We do training for free. We provide all the equipment to them to set up their beehives. Also, we empower them on other eco-friendly livelihood like. Uh, talk about poetry and uh, bigree in this in, the, in their communities even aquaculture and they love doing it and it helped to improve their livelihood it helped to improve their standard of living even at a level of the the plastic as i mentioned earlier it has been a source of income a sort of revenue a sort of livelihood even a job to some community members they do this now as their daily job collecting plastics and selling to make some money you know, you can raise money daily that you can maybe have something to eat daily. And it's something that has been helping them and they have been testifying of this. So yeah, this is just like some of the importance of how this has helped the community in terms of like reducing also the flooding, the flood that have destroyed life and property in our communities. Yeah, all of this is something very valuable. Planting the trees also help this to in climate change mitigation and yeah, just to name a few, I think there are other many benefits that I can't say it all. I see time is really not on our side. We are running out of time. Yeah. I know, but this is, but it, you speak to something that we like to emphasize so much in our conservation and ocean programs. And that is for so long, it's been sort of pitted that it's the environment or people. You have to choose which one you support. And increasingly, there are amazing groups like yours that showcase that it's both. If you replant the forest, you improve water quality, you improve habitat for wildlife, you have places where people can hunt and fish and play. If you clean up plastic, you give people a livelihood. I mean, all these things are linked where yeah. the environment helps people. And this is something that we really want to focus on over the course of this Impact 5 series. Um, I, I couldn't be happier with today's program. Thank you so much for joining us, for your enthusiasm, for your passion and the amazing work that you've done. I want to encourage all our classes to check out the Environment and Food Foundation's website below. Uh, do check out Impact 5 Canada on social media, on their website, the Canadian Ocean Literacy Coalition with DIS, the All of Atlantic Blue Schools Network. And yesterday we had the chance to hear about some amazing resources at Ocean Week Canada about Indigenous and uh, Western sort of science coming together and some really, really cool uh, resources that you can check out at oceanweekcan.ca. Ayamba, thank you so, so much. Diz, if you want to pop back in and say hi as well, there you are. Come on in, everybody. Um, Ayamba, what we do to end every broadcast, I'm going to bring in our classes to say a big thank you and farewell. So on YouTube, you guys can yell at home. Miss Cabahog, Miss Agravat's class, unmute your mics. Thank you both so, so much. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye. <laughs>